So here's that hubless or hubbed rotor. And here's those bearings he's talking about. And like Steven said, he had to go through a whole procedure. Um, usually it included removing them. And there was an inner and outer brace. There's a spindle right here. So uh, machine shaft that stuck out is the threads right here. And then the nut right here would tighten down on these threads, sandwiching all this stuff together. You had inner and outer roll bearing. Usually it's a small one. This is a bigger one. You have a grease seal. And the trick was is you took the nut off, you take the outer bearing out, put the nut back on there, and then when you just yank the rotor off, and then the nut will catch the bearing, which will pull the sill off and usually not damage the sill. Then you take it to the parts washer and remove all the old grease. You would inspect these bearings. Here's an ASC question. What if only one bearing was, like one roller on one of these bearings was damaged? You need to replace both. You got to replace the whole thing, right? Not just the bearing, there's also a race you can't see in here. Um, the other half of the bearing, this piece right here, they're, they're, they're machine matched. If you replace the bearing, you got to replace this race, which we need to get like a, a punch or a brass drift is usually better, which is like a big punch made out of brass so it didn't damage this thing. You don't have to worry about damaging it when you're knocking it out because you're throwing it away, but when you put a new one in there, um, you have to bang these things out. And then if you had the right tool, it would match this and it was kind of like a punch too and you'd beat it with a hammer and it would re, uh, reposition or seat this thing down in there and you replace the bearing. Either way, reusing the old bearing or installing a new bearing, you had to repack the bearings. And that's what that grease is. That's bearing packing grease right there. And you'd squeeze it in the open end until it oozed out. So here's the opening right here until it oozed out of this side over here, the, the, the narrow end. Um, then you put it all back together. Normally you would spin the rotor as you tighten down this nut. Usually it's just snug, but there is like a very low torque specification if you look at the repair manual. Usually it's some, some number of inch pounds or whatever. And then you back it off, usually like an eighth of an inch or, or eighth of a turn or a quarter of a turn. Isn't it the reason why you back it off is because like that first tightening it's to make sure that it's like in there completely. Yes, that's exactly why. You, and drilled into this spindle is a hole that this cotter pin goes through, and it is either they call it a castled nut, looks like a castle has like slots in the top of the nut, <coughs> or a castled washer goes over that, and basically the pin keeps the nut from unscrewing because you just loosened it. Um, now there's the ASC question about, another ASC question that you'll often see on the brakes ASC, is what happens is if the hole in the, either the castle nut or the retainer right here doesn't line up with the hole in the spindle? Should you turn the nut to slightly tighten it to get the next hole to line up, or should you loosen it to get the previous hole to line up? Loosen it. If you have to turn this nut in order to get the hole to line up to put the carter pin through there, Always loosen, never tighten. Uh, the problem with these things is, is they're tapered, right? So when you start tightening down, it wedges in there. It's really the bearing that holds the wheel on the car. And when you would over tighten these things, that would cause the wheel to come off of the car, especially, you know, usually happen at particularly bad times, you know, freeway speeds or going around a corner or something like that. And a lot of people didn't know what they were doing caused a lot of accidents because they would think it needed to be tight. They would tighten this thing down and tighten it and tighten it and tighten it. No, oh, the thing's got to be a little bit loose. Matter of fact, there's a, another specification that's on the AAC practice test in the computer lab that you guys are going to take. You should verify that it's properly preloaded. That's the terminology for setting the tightness of this nut, preloading. And how you do that is you get a dial indicator, a magnetic based dial indicator. You attach the magnet to the disc and then put the tip of the dial indicator on the spindle and you push and pull. You should have between one and five thousandths of an inch. That's the number you want to write down. That's, that's the answer to the um, new <coughs> one to five thousandths of an inch free play or end to end play or whatever you want to call it. If you have nothing, 
that was too tight and you could have premature or catastrophic bearing failure. If it was more than five thousandths, then you could have premature bearing failure. It was too loose. So between one and five thousandths was the specification. That's how you knew that you backed it off the proper amount. Usually it's between like an, an eighth or a quarter of a turn backwards, but it could vary between different cars because they could have coarse threads, they could have fine threads. The, whatever the, the angle that you backed it off, it needed to make that end play between one and five thousandths of an inch. If it was less than that, you need to back it off a little bit more. If it was more than that, you backed it off too much. Most technicians didn't know that. They would just tighten it, back it off a little bit, slap it back together, and usually it was fine. Too tight is significantly worse than too loose here. Yeah, there's a number right there, one to five thousandths. Yeah, is that? Yeah, so on that ASE question, it was, um, when you replace one wheel bearing, you need to replace what else? The race as well. See when you, you see my mean here. <laughs> That part I was talking about that you had to hammer out. So they come like a, they come in a set like this. Mm -hmm. I've seen some people, and, it, and it's happened, I guess, at a lot of other places too, where people would only replace the bearing right here, like a cursor one way. They simply replace this and try to reuse the race that's inside of here. Okay. They weren't made, they weren't built together. They were probably made by different factories, different manufacturers. Or even the same manufacturer. It doesn't matter. These things are matched. It's a matched pair. So you always have to replace this race. So it, it would have said, like, what's the correct repair? It would say, oh, replace the race by itself. Replace the bearing by itself. Just repack it full of grease or replace the set. And that's the answer is replace the set. Even if it was only one of those rollers on there. My cursor disappears when I get over there. So even if all the other rollers are in perfect shape, you'd replace the whole assembly. Um, and don't people also, like, they put the bearing in wrong on the device? Yeah, it was, it's really not that difficult to work on these things if you know what you're doing. Yeah. But there's a lot of things that you can screw up on here. And I think that was part of the reason why they disappeared. It's just, there's too many untrained people making dangerous cars. So now they're, they're uh, not serviceable. It's just, uh, I'll, I'll, let's see what Google images shows up. Wheel bearing. I have one, but it's all the way in the back closet over there and it's faster just to, this is what you're gonna get. Something like this. See those studs, this is where the rotor would slide onto. This would bolt to the steering knuckle. And that shaft, that, yeah, right there. Actually, there's one right there. Let's show it to the camera, I guess. No, I don't know if these are gonna fit. Hmm. Not really, but close. Separate. So this is a non-serviceable, non-adjustable bearing. picture right there. This is what you're going to see. So that spindle right here is going to disappear. Now some people, this, this assembly right here, the spindle was attached to, it's, it used to be common, they would refer to this whole assembly as the spindle. And sometimes books and people still do, even if it doesn't have that spindle anymore. You guys know what this thing is technically called? The knuckle? Yeah, steering knuckle. Steering knuckle is like the foundation of your brakes. It's the foundation of your steering. It's the foundation of your suspension. It's what connects everything together. It's like the framework, I guess. And then, you know, solid and ventilated rotors. That doesn't really take a whole lot of imagination to figure out the difference. Generally, this is found on the front axle because that's where the majority of the braking is, is happening. And on the rear, a lot less is happening. So most of the time you will have solid in the rear, but not always. Sometimes you'll see some 
you know, higher performance cars, they will have ventilated on both front and rear, or, or some heavier trucks. If I said composite rotor, what would you guys think of? It has like two different materials in it. Right? What kind of materials would you think of? Yeah. Uh, aluminum? What? For what? What's the question? If I just said the word composite rotor, what comes to mind? Composite steel. Most of them now are going to be like some carbon ceramic or carbon fiber. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll see what Google says. What did I call them? Composite. Composite. Something. Composite rotors. So like, like the carbon things. rotors are like Porsche and the yeah. and stuff. Yeah. These things are expensive, man. Corvette and stuff. Um, and we'll see why these things are beneficial over steel rotors later on. <coughs> this is a composite rotor. We don't really deal with them in this class. This is like supercar stuff or really expensive upgrades to a race car. I'm to do that. Oh man, let me work with our Lamborghini. How much do you think these kits cost? <laughs> these are cheap. What? These are cheap. Nine thousand. They go up to over twenty thousand. These are not composite. I don't know why they showed up. These are not composite. These are not composite. Here's some. Big brake kit. Carbon ceramic. They won't even tell you the price. Nine thousand. Oh yeah, nine thousand dollars. They, they range between five and twenty-two thousand dollars for these brake kits. Ooh, nice. But they're cool, right? So you got like a, I don't know, it's like a, a still. Like four wheel. Huh? Four wheel or it's one. No, just one axle. So like two on the front or two on the back. Ah. Uh, two is twenty-two thousand. Yeah, yeah, they're. They can get really pricey. Um, anyway, so basically, what makes it composite is we got this ceramic disc. And like, I don't know, like an anodized steel hub or something like that that bolts onto it. The other picture we looked at was a little bit clear. Way to go, way to go, way to go. Anyway, that's what most people think about. Let's click on that one. Um, we talk about composite brakes. Which, which car used this? Uh, this is an upgrade for this is for a Tesla. This is an upgrade for your Tesla brakes, which is kind of stupid because Tesla doesn't really really use brakes. They use regenerative braking. They use the generator to recharge the battery because it's an electric car. These are just there to supplement that. They just do it because you can't really mod a Tesla that much. You can't really customize the Tesla that much, so they do things like that to seem all like just, just to find a way to waste your money, I guess. Yeah, just a way to flex. Mm -hmm. There's one cool. customer in here. <laughs> you give it on a bigger motor. Five stars. Oh. You give it five stars. Yeah. Anyway, there was another composite rotor back in the day. One customer is with you. Yeah. And someone yeah. bought it. Someone, well, someone bought it and and uh, reviewed the product. They're crazy. Anyway, there's a, there's a different type of composite rotor. So if, you know, late '90s, early 2000s, manufacturers were really struggling to. Um, make cars get good mileage, make power, and have clean emissions. Right? The te technology wasn't where it is today. So they were trying all kinds of crazy stuff to get that to happen. Like we talked about those low drag calipers that GM made, where they cut the corner off of where that little groove of the square cut seal set, so that the square cut seal bent or deflected further, so it pulled the brake pad back further when released. Supposedly that made the car use less gas. I don't think it was that great idea because they're not doing it anymore. Nobody else did it, but GM did it for a couple of years. Um, another seemingly, I don't know, I think it sounded stupid, is they made a different type of composite rotor. So instead of making it out of cast iron, they made the disc out of cast iron and then the hat, and this customer calling it a web, out of steel. Yeah. How much weight do you think that really saved? Not much. 
probably a couple ounces, right? A couple of ounces. But man, how much more money do you think this thing costs to manufacture? Oh, man. Oh, man. Instead of casting one disc, now you had to join together two different metals and do it uniformly and reliably. You had to, I don't think they welded them or, I mean, they'd have to weld them, right? How do you join metals together? I guess you can glue it, but they didn't glue these. Anyway, um, there's a test question on the test that these things require special adapters on a brake lathe. Otherwise, they vibrate so much that it ruins the rotors. We got the adapters out there. I'll show you when we're out there. But that's a, that's a test question you guys are going to be asked. Do composite rotors require special adapters on the brake lathe? Yes, they do. Is that like an ASC question? No, it's like a, I think it might be a final question. I know it's a te uh, one of the assessment questions in this class. And it's a dumbass question because we don't have any of these rotors anymore. We had a couple that were floating around. There might be one out there somewhere. So it's, it's, you're getting tested on something that you never actually dealt with. So I'm, I'm just going to tell you the answer. Yes, yes, you do. What? Special adapters. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're basically, you know those adapters? I don't know if you guys have ever used a brake lathe. They got these adapters to get it to fit. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. kind of like that, but these things got a big, giant chunk of rubber inside the adapters, the parts that normally don't have any rubber in it. To reduce noise? Or? No, to, to keep it from vibrating. Vibrate. Chattering is what they call it. Because when it vibrates, it, it you don't want your cutting bit or the rotor to be vibrating against each other because it will destroy the surface. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm sure that the benefit versus reward eventually lost its appeal because they stopped doing this. They, a lot of manufacturers are doing it for a couple of years, like, like I said, late 90s, early 2000s. They don't do it anymore. I, I don't know if anybody's doing it anymore. I'm pretty sure they don't. Toyota was doing it for a while. They're not doing it anymore because it's just so much more expensive to save a couple of ounces. Anyway, so nowadays when people talk about composite rotors, this is what they talk about. Um, generally, you're not going to see these on a, a daily driver unless somebody you know gets a Ferrari or something or a Porsche or like the whatever that top the is it the C8 whatever that Corvette is. Mm -hmm. I think that comes with them from the factory. But these things are, they're significantly more expensive. They're very expensive. Um, and you don't machine these things. You just, you can save a little bit of money by unbolting the disc and bolting a new disc on there and, and can keep the hub. But they're still very expensive. All right, so let's talk about a little bit of the, the science behind what these things have to do. So do you guys know, I, I might have mentioned it like first day. You guys know what the thermal energy unit is to measure heat energy? BTUs. There's a couple of them. BTUs and calories are, BTUs is the British thermal unit. Calories is the metric version of it. Calories, they, they, they measure the energy level of food, right? You get a thousand calories. Well, you're not going to burn that energy off, so you're going to get fat. You know what I mean? All that fat, all that, all that unused energy is going to be stored as fat in your body. Anyway, so let's kind of learn about that. You know what a BTU is? It's kind of a weird measurement. They take a gallon or a pound of water, not a gallon. I don't know why they don't use a gallon, but one pound of water. And it's the amount of heat energy required to raise that one pound of water by one degree. Mm. So, what is a BTU? And it's actually, it's at a specific temperature. And I don't remember what it was. I think it was like 70 degrees or something like that. I don't remember. But that's basically what it is. It's the amount of energy, heat energy it takes to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. Because remember, that's the, the, the imperial one. So, okay, what is a calorie? It's, would, it, would you be able to guess what a calorie is? What's the metric version of that? Is it going to be a gallon? Is it going to be Fahrenheit? I think it's Celsius. And, and liters or something. What is a calorie? I thought you deleted deficit. Okay. 
Okay, what is the definition of a pansexual? What? It's a pansexual. <laughs> Of course, they're not going to just show us a picture. So we have to go right there. So it's one gram of water by one degree Celsius. The one, one gram. So how is that different than degrees? Degrees is not heat energy. It's the concentration of heat energy. It's not the amount. It's kind of like water pressure in gallons, right? Well, this is five psi of water. What? No, this is. Well, if it was full, it would be a liter of water, right? They're two different uh, measurements, right? We got water pressure or water weight, like they're using, you know, grams and uh, um, pounds, right? And I said liter. Liter is not weight. Gram is the metric weight for, yeah, it's the unit for metric weight. Grams, kilograms. Um, so, uh, oh. As you can imagine, a gallon and a pound are not the same thing, right? So a BTU or a calorie and temperature is not the same thing. One's an amount and one temperature is really the concentration of it. Um, you guys ever burn ants with the magnifying glass? Yeah. That's an example of concentrating the, the existing heat energy that's in the sun. Or that's, technically, that's not heat energy, that's solar radiation energy, right? And you're concentrating it. So when you concentrate that energy, what did it do to the temperature? Increases. It increased it. Um, that's actually how I think, and this thing up here work. Um, somebody figured out how to use chemicals and they mess around with pressures and evaporating and condensing points and pressures to take the heat out of here and put it outside the room, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't cool the room by blowing cold air in here. It cools the room by removing the heat out of here and putting it outside. So if we turn that air conditioner on, it blows cold air here, but you go to the outside thing, it's gonna be hot air blowing out of the outside of the air conditioner. It's removing the heat energy. And you guys are gonna come back and, and really study this a lot more in HVAC, uh, BTUs and calories, mainly BTUs, because we're American, we don't use the metric system very often. Um, but you can see it's the equivalent, right? It's one degree by one unit of weight. In America, it's one pound and one degree Fahrenheit. In the metric system, a calorie is one gram and one degree Celsius. So this is the same thing, just using metric and non-metric stuff. All right, so this is why the thickness of a rotor makes the difference between the car being safe or dangerous. So. These two lighters are identical. They got the same amount of heat energy. <clears throat> These two pieces of metal are not the same. This is a screwdriver, this is a T-pin. If anybody had a lighter, I got a T-pin around here somewhere, we get that T-pin glowing bright red in a couple of seconds. You get a uh, number three Phillips screwdriver, that thing would probably never glow. You can burn all the fuel in that lighter Assuming we're not using anything other than that lighter, but if you're using a cigarette lighter, that's that number two screwdriver. This thing will never glow from a cigarette lighter. Because it has more mass, right? So they both have the same amount of BTUs or heat energy applied to it, but they are very different temperatures. This one is so hot that it's glowing. This one is not hot enough to glow. So as you can see, a car is gonna have the same thermal heat energy demands of the brakes, right? Because to slow a car down, you're converting kinetic energy into heat energy. But if you have a rotor that's nice and thick versus a rotor that's worn down and thin, they're not gonna be able to handle it the same. This one's gonna overheat. So which one has the highest temperature? Which one has the highest temperature? Yeah, not, not heat energy. Remember, temperature is like the concentration of heat. Hey, man, it's glowing red. Hey, it's glowing. Um, so does it take a lot to 
Imagine why the thickness of a rotor is important. It's very important, right? Because remember, the rotor is the one dealing with the seat. Uh, so there is a minimum thickness specification. That is the line in the sand that the engineer said that based on the weight of this vehicle and the speeds that these vehicles are expected to run, that this thing is going to be able to handle that plus a little. <coughs> so they speed their car, the brakes should hopefully handle it, right? But they drive their car as designed and they're not driving recklessly or speeding or whatever, the brakes will definitely handle it. But they usually make it a little bit better than what it needs to handle, just as a little margin of safety. If the rotor is below that minimum thickness, that rotor is not safe to be driven on the road because it's gonna do this rather than this. What happens when the brakes overheat? Brake fade. Brake fade, they stop working. Okay, what are the signs of brake fade? Or overheating, I should say. Heat spots. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of them. And then you don't, uh, you wouldn't, what they call it, not stand it down, but, uh, you know, machine it? Huh? Machine, machine it? Yeah, you want to machine it that had a hot spot. You throw hot spots away. Or they got all kinds of different names for it. So this, this is in order of severity. One of the most common and least severe is glazing. Glazing is where it gets, it's like buffed, it's polished, it's super shiny. You think that's gonna be beneficial for friction if it's super slippery? No. So this, it's not ideal. It's going to slightly increase the stopping distance. The brakes are not gonna work as good. But this happens a little bit. It's kind of pretty common, right? I don't know if I'd call it dangerous, but it's not ideal. If we got a little bit hotter, you got what's called heat checking. Well, before we get to that point, you think we can fix this with the brake lathe? So remember, when you machine a rotor, when you're done with that rotor, when you put it back on the car, it has to be thick enough still. You still, you want to be above the minimum thickness specification. You gotta leave a little bit of room for wear, right? It's not a good idea to cut a rotor all the way down to its minimum specification and put it on a car. Because if it's okay today, is it gonna last the life of the brake pads? No. Probably not, right? As soon as it wears out a little bit, it's too thin. So you gotta leave a little bit of margin in there. Make a, leave a little bit of room for wear. The generic number is 15 thousandths. That is probably gonna be a test question right there. How much thicker should a rotor be at least 15 thousandths above the minimum thickness. Another name for this specification is the, um, the machine tube thickness or the uh, minimum service thickness. So wait, does the minim is the minimum thickness like different for each car? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> is, um, what is it? That's the machine tube thickness. That's the smallest you'd ever machine it and put it back in service with the new set of brake pads. So that 15 thousandths gives you a little bit of room for wear so those brake pads can wear into that rotor and, and that's insurance that they're gonna stay above that discard thickness, which is what's stamped on the rotor, which means you gotta throw it away. Yeah. Um, for those um, vented and solid rotors, it's different, right? Yeah, yeah, every, every rotor is gonna be different. Um, so you're generally gonna have three specifications. You got what Toyota calls standard thickness. That is brand new out of the box. And the good thing about knowing the, the starting thickness when it's brand new versus you know, where it is today is you can kind of get a rough idea of, of how long this, this rotor is going to last, right? As long as things don't change, like you would never guarantee it, right? Because maybe like some lady, old lady was driving a car, now her like heavy footed grandson starts driving the car and you guaranteed this rotor is gonna last another two years. You know, you kind of shot yourself in the foot because that's things out of your control. So you never guarantee it, but you can give the customer, you know, a rough idea. Like, okay, well, you know, your rotors or your brake pads or whatever, you know, they're, they're wearing at a rate of, I don't know, 3,000 of an inch per year. Based on this thing, you got X amount of months left or years left until it's gonna get close to needing to be replaced. As long as things don't change, right? Now we can't guarantee that, but it's just a, that's just a rough idea. So, some places like to do that to build value into the service, right? If 
you know, that, that, that's one of Toyota's philosophies is they don't try to be the cheapest. They're not a budget car company. Um, they're looking more for value, for people willing to spend a little bit more, more money to get a little bit more. You know, they won't buy the cheapest car. They'll spend a little bit more money on the car, but they'll get a much better car out of it. That's kind of like their, their business philosophy. And that's one of the things that they've emphasized a lot in service departments at Toyota dealerships. Right? They want to give customers, you know, more than what they, only what they're paying for. Information, peace of mind, you know, that this car was looked over by a factory technician and this is what they found and you know everything that's going on with your car, you know it's going to be safe to drive to work, like the wheel isn't going to fall off, your brakes aren't going to, you know, they're not on the verge of failing and causing an accident or something like that. As opposed to just to taking it somewhere down the street and they just slap some pads on and give it back and go, oh, yeah, it's ready to go. Okay, well, how's everything else? Or, you know, are you sure that it's not leaking coolant and my engine's about to overheat? You know, they provide all that information for you. It makes people feel like they're, they're getting more for, for it. And sometimes tracking where um, is, is one of those things. It's a little step that gives the customer more value. GM says 30 thousandths. So remember I said uh, generically it's 15 thousandths. GM says they want 30 thousandths above minimum thickness. That's their machine to wear. So the first one is standard thickness. The second one is machine to wear. That's the thinnest that you should ever give the rotor back to the customer with new sets of brakes. The third one is discard. That is the one that you will see somewhere etched or stamped into the rotor. That means when you get to that point, you throw it away, right? So that's our three specifications. Standard, machine to, and discard or throw away. Toyota gives you two of those. They give you standard and throwaway. Um, generally, it's 15,000, it's even with Toyotas, unless the repair manual says something different. So uh, you're gonna be asked questions about what, what, what are we going to do about this? Do we need to replace this rotor? Or can this rotor be fixed with the brake lathe? Uh, if it's thick enough. As long, there you go. As long as it's thick enough, we can machine this to fix it. So can, can this be fixed by the brake lathe? Maybe, based on the thickness. If there's enough material, material here that we can you know, resurface it and still be you know, 15 thousandths or more above that throwaway thickness, that's probably what you should do. That would be better better for the customer, you know what I mean? It'd be better for the technician too. Because guess what you're gonna do now? You're gonna add some labor time for using the brake lathe. You don't get paid more money to replace rotors. Right? Some shops do give technicians like a very, very small percentage of parts. Most don't. Most you only get paid by labor. So meaning that you're taking that rotor off and putting it back on. Um, because you're already getting paid to disassemble the brakes. You're not getting paid anything additional from what you already got paid, but if you're machining it, now you're getting paid the labor to machine it, which could be another hour on your paycheck for that one job. Okay, the next severe heat checking. These look like little tiny surface cracks. This is a little bit more severe. This rotor got a little bit hotter than the other one did. The difference between this and a crack rotor is these things are only on the surface. Can we fix this with a brake lathe? No, it says on the bottom, yeah. Yes, awesome. and it's the same, it's same the caveat. Heating? Yeah, it's overheated. Way can too that, hot. Can that also cause like chipping where like when you put it on the brake lathe it kind of chips away a little bit more than it should? If they're, if they're a little too deep, then yeah. And then it could be under the thickness? Now, if I start seeing a little bit more severe signs of overheating here, you really should do some investigating, right? It should never have gotten that hot. Um, it'd be a mistake just to, re you know, machine it, put new brake pads on there and send it out. What would you be looking for if you saw this on a rotor? Driving, right? Go see if it drags. Go check the other side. Maybe the other side has a problem with it, forcing this side to do more than its fair share of work. 
Um, so, you know, check the other side, check for dragging brakes, check the adjustment of the rear brakes, because some drummer brakes, sometimes the, the adjuster doesn't work all that. All right, so we don't really have much left. We're gonna go to the shindig here in a few minutes. Um, but this is an important concept. Because on the ASC, it's important to service brakes properly to understand this, well, especially diagnose them, or prevent the problem to begin with. It is the sequence of events. Um, Something caused excessive lateral runout. Yeah, it's true that sometimes if the road out, run out is really bad, and sometimes it's that bad, at, brand new out of the box, especially if they stack it like this. When you go on a test drive, the car will shake when you hit the brake pedal. But because it does not shake when you hit the brake pedal does not mean that the lateral run out is not excessive. What is excessive? So for the front rotors, the specification is two thousandths, and that's for almost every manufacturer. That's a number you're going to want to write down as well. You're going to be testing on that number. Um, it's two thousandths. Or front rotor? Just, just in general. They allow a little bit more in the back. You're not going to be tested on the back specification. Everybody except for like Nissan, Infiniti, and I think some Subarus say one thousandth is the maximum all allowable amount. So what if you got four thousandths? That's twice as much. Are you gonna fill that on your test drive? No. Then why is it a problem? Well, over time, that bent rotor is in the same spot over and over and over again. And that can do one of two things. That can either wear out that rotor in that one spot, cause thickness variation, or it can actually put an excessive amount of brake pad deposit material or material deposited on the rotor in that one spot, especially if they're really hot. It's normal for you to, to deposit a little bit of brake pad material. That actually improves the way the brakes work. But if it's hot and it keeps scraping in that one spot, it's going to deposit an excessive amount of brake material. Same result though. So if it's only like four thousandths, five thousandths, it's you know, just a little bit above the maximum allowable lateral runout, it's going to take months or a, you know a few thousand miles, and that's how they talk about it on the ASC. It's like oh, a car came in there, got brand new brake pads and rotors. Seven thousand miles later, the customer comes back with the brake pedal pulsation complaint. Which of the following is most likely the cause? Well, that answer is going to be improperly work lug nuts. Maybe they just did a circle pattern. Maybe they just used an impact gun so that it wasn't tightened down properly. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today, but uh, what's, I'm just going to mention it. And you, you probably heard this from Steve. What's worse? What's more dangerous, loose lug nuts or over-tightened lug nuts? Over-tightened. Over-tightened. Why? Because you could strip. Um, he said something like you could. Um, you don't get a warning. All this just happens. Because he said at one time, dude was turning his back and we just... Yeah. What what that doesn't mean that it's gonna prevent it, but what hopefully will the customer feel before their wheel comes off if they're oh, loose? Why is my car wide going like this? I probably should go check my oh shit, the wheel's about to fall off. That ain't gonna happen if they're over tightened. Now all bolts they have a little bit of elasticity to them. Right? And torquing them stretches them just enough that they shouldn't stretch anymore and work themselves loose. That's why they need to be torqued down. Just like your, 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 you know, your t-shirt or your, you know, your stretch band underwear. What happens if you overstretch them? They don't go back, right? You exceed their elasticity or their maximum stretch, then they're permanently stretched. Well, that's what happens to bolts. If you over tighten them, they get stretched and weakened. And then when you go around a, tor a, a, a turn or a corner or something like that, and all the weight of the vehicle gets put on that thing, it goes from working perfectly fine to shearing off immediately no warning no wobbling the wheel comes off and you know you're going fast enough or in the wrong spot that could be deadly for somebody um, there is a whole industry out there and you can google it normally i google it in class but we're running really short on time um, called metallurgic forensic investigators 
So when there is an accident and it results in a death or a large, you know, a large amount of money or expensive things being damaged, insurance companies don't want to pay for that. So they will hire these investigative laboratories out there, or even the uh, you know TSA or uh, not TSA, the FAA. Like when there's a plane crash, they want to see if it's pilot error or equipment failure or something like that. Um, whenever there's a mechanical thing, cause like that train wreck that happened a couple weeks ago in Ohio, or, or a will comes off and kills somebody, these forensic investigators, they can determine who's at fault. They can determine that these lug nuts were over tightened. That's why the will came off, and that's why the, the vehicle caused a 15 car accident on the freeway. And then they can go and say, you did this. You're the last one to work on this thing. You over tightened it. And they can prove it in court. And then you can be held criminally and civilly liable. You can get sued and even get charged with, you know, some kind of negligence, negligent homicide if somebody dies or whatever. Yeah, you, you can get a lot of trouble for it. it. Doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Right? It's very rare. It will never happen if you do it properly. I've heard in like some one cases like, you know, they've been instructed like not to torque blood nuts. They just hit with the impact wrench. Yeah, th that, that's going to be a small shop. If you go to a large shop like Larry H. Miller, they have like 80 dealerships. Places that are big enough that they've had issues and they've gotten sued over this, they are extremely strict. If you work for a large company that has lots of locations, it's more likely you're going to see this. Um, all the shops I worked at, you would get fired if two people didn't sign the work order. You got to put a cone behind the car at one place that worked at, and you would torque all the lug nuts with the torque wrench, sign off on there, go find somebody else, you know, your supervisor or coworker. They would have to double check with the torque wrench and also sign on the second line. That's why I don't like mechanics that say, like, oh, I don't torque anything down, I just give it a couple other others, and it's like, did yeah. that's, that's supposed safe. to be That's supposed to be a meme, <laughs> not, not instructions. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I know there's, there's actual mechanics that actually, like, um, they do the work by that way. They don't listen to the <laughs> So here's basically that sequence of events. That's worst case scenario. Best case scenario, this will happen. And when you they start off the video, one of the most, co most difficult problems to fully resolve is not an exaggeration. This is, I was talking about this earlier. We saw this with the on-car brake wave. But back then they weren't common, so other dealerships, they were never able to fix this, so the car kept coming back and eventually was legally a lemon car and it ended up being a buyback and then we would buy it from the auction and, and the car is perfectly fine. We just use the on-car brake lane, we fix this properly and we sell the car for good money and whatever. Anyway, this is really good because it puts that sequence into, of events. One of the most difficult problems to fully resolve is brake pedal pulsation, a condition caused by excessive lateral runout of the brake rotors. When runout is excessive, a portion of the rotor comes in contact with the brake pad on each revolution, causing irregular wear at the contact point, resulting in thickness variation on the rotor surface. So how long does it take to go from someone using an impact gun to it causing enough lateral run out that causes enough you know, uneven wear to the point where it causes the brake pedal to pulse it? It can be weeks or it can be months. So your test drive and the brakes are fine doesn't mean that the car is not going to come back. The only way you can be sure is you put a dial indicator on there and you can get pretty quick at it and know that it's two thousandths or less. Then you don't have to worry about it as long as somebody else doesn't do that. You can measure thickness variation with a micrometer. Take your readings at eight equidistant points on the rotor then subtract the smallest reading from the largest. If it is greater than eight ten thousandths of an inch, or two hundredths of a millimeter, the rotor should be resurfaced. That's another specification you're going to need to remember on your test. There's two of them. Two thousandths of an inch, maximum lateral run out. Eight ten thousandths of an inch, uh, maximum thickness variation. Ah, uh, good. So make sure the rear brakes are contributing like they're supposed to too. The slide pins? Maybe. Yeah, maybe the slide pins are holding the brake pad against the rotor all the time because they don't release like they're supposed to. Um, 
What if you see like a, if it's a Subaru and they got a vape? And they got a bunch of like, uh, what are those little, little, little dolls they put on drift cars? The bobble heads? No, like they usually, like, they, they, they hang them off the back bumper. Oh, the balls? No, like the little dolls. Oh. Like little Japanese dolls. Oh, no, no, I can't remember what they're called. Anyway, you, you look at this thing, like, they got a bunch of anime seat covers, hentai seat covers or something. You, you pray for that car. What are you going to think happened here? Maybe it's stereotyping, but I'm going to think they're, they're abusing the fuck out of their brakes. Or, yeah. excuse me, abusing their brakes, right? They're trying to drift, and they're failing really bad. <laughs> I had a situation like this, and I wasn't, it wasn't exactly the same, but there was a, uh, I was working on a Chrysler dealership, and there was this, this Ram truck that kept having overheating brakes, and I could never find anything wrong with it. It kept coming back every couple of months with brake problems, right? And the boss was like, you know, starting to get on me. He's like, man, this is not good. You know, what's going on? Why is this truck keep coming back? I'm like, man, I'm trying to figure it out. Third time I was coming in, I seen that truck getting dropped off again. And it was a 1500, a half ton truck. And they were pulling, um, what the hell they call it? Those excavators, those big ass construction equipment. There was significantly more than the, um, the towing capacity of that truck. Of course. I took a picture of my phone. I said, hey, I found out what's wrong with that truck. Cause he was like, when I was walking in, I was like, he was like, oh, that changes everything. <laughs> And he called them up. He's like, "Hey, we can't warranty your brakes anymore. Um, they're, they're, they're you're using them for what they're not designed for. You know what I mean? Like they, they should have had a, a truck that had the towing capacity rated for those, the the, the kind of weight that that thing was was pulling. And like, and they, they came and was like, "Oh yeah, we pull that thing all the time. Yeah, we didn't know. Like, yeah, you didn't know, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I I did the brakes again, but I got paid for it." I didn't have to do it. I'd have to do it for free again. I didn't, I didn't have to warranty it. Fortunately, the time before, I was just, I was just out of luck that time. <clears throat> they wouldn't reimburse me for it because they don't want to. They don't want to, you know, piss the customer off. We already did it for free once. We're not gonna go back. Hey, you know what? One time, like you know, three months ago, yeah, we, you have to pay for that now because they, they spent a lot of money with us. You know what I mean? So they, it was just better to, to keep the customer and, and eat the cost. But we wasn't gonna keep doing it because it wasn't gonna help anybody out. They were gonna continue to be unhappy with the brake job. And, I, and we were going to continue to have to fix this brake job for free, and it just made it just was bad for everybody. But one, just a little bit of education is like, hey, you know, you know, if you look in the, this manual right here, you know, the towing capacity I think was like six thousand pounds or something like that, and they were pulling like thirty-five thousand pounds, or it was significantly more. Um, and they they just used a different vehicle to pull that thing around, and never had a problem again. Um, so you should investigate it. This is a little worrying when it's this bad, right? By just slapping new brakes on there and not figuring out and hopefully fixing this, uh, the original cause of this overheating, um, you might be setting yourself up for failure. Now, what if that rotor is too thin? That might be the whole reason right there, right? Maybe that rotor is just, it was overheating, not because of a problem, I guess that is a problem, the rotor's too thin, but because that rotor wasn't able to deal with that heat and the temperature, like that little T-pin was going too high. Just don't fix it. Find out why. And if the rotor's the reason why, fine. But if it's not the rotor, that rotor's above thickness, you can fix this with the brake lathe because that surface cracks are only on the surface. As long as when you remove them, that rotor is still plenty above the minimum thickness. Um, but make sure there's nothing else doing this because it's going to happen again. You know, if the rear brakes are out of adjustment. If they're driving their car in a way that it wasn't meant to be designed. Um, if you got a caliper that's you know, sticking or a brake hose that's sticking or something like that. You know, I would just, I'd be nervous about that. Especially this one right here, crack yes. rotor. Can you fix this with the brake lathe? No. 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 Definitely not. The, as a matter of fact, they should not drive this thing. Now, most states, you know, people. There's, there's always a rumor out there. Oh, I'm gonna not give the. I'm not. I'm not gonna give the, the keys back to them, right? Until they fix this or tow it off. And yeah, that's kind of most places. That's theft. Right? It's still in their car. What you really need to do is you need to clearly document it that the customer is fully aware that this car is not safe to be driven on the road. Because you know what's gonna happen. They're gonna blame you. Yeah, they're gonna decline the work, and then if it if it does fail, 
and you know that thing just falls off or whatever, and they get into an accident. Well, I just had my car at the shop. They didn't say anything about this. Well, they said it was safe. So you that repair order thing I was looking at, you would document it on there, and usually they'd make them sign it as proof that they acknowledged that they were told this isn't safe to drive. Most most people are not that irresponsible, but some are. You know, they may not have the money. Like I don't get paid for another week. Okay, well maybe you should just leave it here and we can give you right home. Whatever. You know, a lot of dealerships will have a, a shuttle van that they can give them right home, or maybe someone can pick them up or get a rental car or whatever. Whatever the case is, um, they ain't driving this thing, at least not without knowing that they're gonna probably kill somebody. <laughs> Cast iron. Cast iron doesn't like to be welded too much. Okay, here's those hard spots. Oh, this way it starts turning purple and blue. And that's you can't. You can't machine that. No. Why not? Because it's hard as metal, dude. You're gonna fuck up your bit and your machine. You guys know what like annealing is? Yeah. yeah. You ever watch like that forged in fire? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You put the they, they harden the steel, they, they they get it really hot, and, and then they quench it, and then they get it real hot again. Or not as hot. They call it tempering or whatever. And then you let it cool slowly. Yeah. Well, that's not what happened here. It's kind of what happened, but uncontrolled and not <coughs> not done like purposely and, and in a good way. So what happens when you get metal really hard? There's usually a give and take with steel. If you make steel very, very hard, it becomes very, very brittle. Do you want brittle brakes? No. No, because they shatter. That's the worst case scenario. Also, when this thing heated up that hot right here, there's possibly micro cracks right here that eventually can also become full on cracks. Best case scenario is this is hardened cast iron. This is soft cast iron. This is soft cast iron. Is that thing gonna wear evenly? No. No. Brakes are very, 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 very sensitive to even the tiniest amount of thickness variation. That's going to cause thickness variation. Um, there are other ways that you can improve rotors. Like I, I used to work for this guy um, in St. Louis. It was just a part-time job. He owned a mobile dyno. Like you put it on a trailer. We would go to car shows, and and I think it was like 85 bucks, and you could put your car on there, and we would dyno it for you, and tell you how much horsepower it made. Nice. Um, we used to do mobile dyno tuning, and we would go to uh, NA, NASA. It's like an amateur, semi-amateur racing league. And they had weight to power ratio rules. And sometimes people would win, like, that guy fucking cheated, that guy cheated, that guy cheated. And we was there to, to certify the win. Like, okay, well, if someone contests it, we're going to die on your car and away. And if you made too much power, you'd get disqualified. And then this, the guy who won second place would get first place or whatever. We never caught anybody cheating, but we would do that. You know, so we'd go to these Saturday, Sunday races or whatever. It was pretty cool. But the guy also, he was a lawyer. He, was, he owned a, um, a bunch of apartments. But he also owned this export business, and he would export like limousines and construction equipment to the Virgin Islands. And he was having problems with limousines because I guess the Virgin Islands has lots of hills in like St. Thomas or whatever. And it was just tearing up the brakes. You know, those limousines are heavy, usually bigger than what the brakes were designed originally designed to ha handle or whatever. And he kept replacing these rotors because they'd they overheat and crack and, and get hard spots and everything. And he was telling me about this, uh, this, this treatment they have. It's kind of like what they do in that forged and fire, but in reverse. They go from a really high temperature to a much lower temperature. But instead of heating it up, they use room temperature, and then they stuck it in liquid nitrogen. They call it cryogenically treated. Now, it didn't make him any harder, but I guess what it did is it rearranged the molecules in a way that made them much more durable. And since then, you can get all kinds, of, you can send all kinds of stuff to them, musical instruments, crankshafts, pistons, rotors. Uh, here's a company, 300 below. I think this is the company you use. Triples the life of the rotors. Here's transmission parts. They do it to guns, like like competition shooters get their 
barrels cryogenically treated. How much does it like cost for this? I don't remember. You know, so I, I never. He just told me, but I've never actually used any of these guys. Yeah, so you you could just upgrade the brakes. But does it work? It, it's cheaper. This is significant. He said it worked. He said it. It, it definitely worked for him because he was replacing rotors way too frequently than when he should have been, and this solved the problem. So they do it for for guns. Fifty percent more accuracy. I see the trade. What if the guy's blind? <laughs> then you get fifty percent better. Reduce wear. Longer life. Hmm? That's fifty times zero. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So what's the most common cause of all these water faults we just looked at? Heat. So what causes heat? Lots of things. Some, sometimes it might, oh yeah, friction is what causes the heat. So what causes the heat damage? Oh, like, oh, breaking. No dissipation of the heat. It's, it's, they could be too small, they just can't handle the heat. Or, like your, um, brakes partially activated all the time. Yeah, some kind of, some kind of fault causes brakes to drag. Or, um, abuse. Or, yeah. other abuse, like racing it or pulling heavy trailers and stuff like that. Intended abuse. Non-intended abuse. All right, so here's where, so we, we, we kind of went over a whole bunch of stuff, things we we're going to touch upon a couple of times, but that was the what is about break, disc brakes. So the, the next, this couple slides and then the next PowerPoint, we're going to learn how to evaluate brakes. Station one of your hands on final. Um, one of the more heavier emphasized things on the ASC. Um, one of the most useful tools to evaluate the condition of a rotor beyond your, just your eyes and looking at it is a micrometer. Now some people would say, well I've always been taught to use a caliper, a digital caliper, a veneer caliper. For some manufacturers this is fine. Not for Toyota specifications. Um, I got this out of a chemistry science book and they were describing this picture and they were describing the dis difference between these two words that are often used together, but in science, specifically with measurements, they have two different meanings, accuracy and precision. And they use this to emphasize that point. So we'll start with accuracy. Accuracy is what you think it is. So if I'm measuring a component that's exactly one inch thick, and five different or six different people seven different people measure that one inch thick thing, everybody got close to an inch. They got close to an accurate measurement, right? But they weren't exactly the same. So that, that's what that bullseye is. So this is highly accurate, where we all got pretty close to the same number, about an inch, but that plus or minus was pretty big. Okay, then what is precision then? Precision is actually consistency or repeatability. So when we, when we talk about, if you ever listen to Steve talk about a shooting or whatever, they don't necessarily call it accurate shooting. Oh, I'm in, a, you know, I'm in this club where we talk about accuracy shooting. Accuracy, they kind of talk about traits with the barrel or whatever, but it's precision shooting. Precision is easy because you can, you know, if you're shooting at a target and you're hitting up here, you just adjust your scope to move your crosshairs down here and bam, now you're hitting the, the bullseye every time. So precision is repeatability or consistency. So if, in this case, six people took a measurement, even though they're wrong, low accuracy, they all got basically the same value each time, That's over wrong. and over and over again, but they're wrong, right? So that would be low accuracy and low, or high precision. Mm -hmm. This is low both, like there's just all over the place. Oh, Obviously what you'd want would be this, both highly accurate and precise. Um, and we can do this, not today, but I like to prove this point. We'll get a caliper, we'll get a micrometer. And, I don't know, I'll just grab something random like this thing right here, and I'll have like four or five, maybe the whole class. 
write down how thick this thing is. And then we would write it on the board. And they're going to be very different from each other. Why? Why would they be different? What affects this thing? One, especially that long right there, it has got to be exactly perfectly 90 degrees. You start going this way, your numbers change drastically. Yeah. Right? Or this way. Then how hard are you pushing it together? Pushing it, push it really hard, you're gonna get very different numbers. If you're barely pushing it, you're gonna get one number. Someone pushes it really hard, it's gonna get a very different number. Everyone is gonna push with a different amount of force right here. Now they got this little wheel right here that's supposed to start slipping, but that thing also changes how it works depending on how hard you push down on it. For certain values, that variance is fine, but not for brakes. The secret here, is this piece right here on the micrometer. Um, never tighten the micrometer right here. You will ruin the micrometer, especially if you start cranking down on it. We got lots of ruined micrometers in the tool crib because people didn't heed that advice. This is a very important tool to learn how to, how to read. And after break, we'll spend the rest of the day before we go over to the other building learning how to read this thing. It's very important for most of your uh, remaining classes here, especially engines. I was going to ask Mark how many times he used my micrometer engines. I bet it would be over a thousand times. Because you're going to take apart a four-cylinder engine, measure every single comp component in there. Most of them require a micrometer to evaluate it, and you put it back together. And you do the same thing again with the six-cylinder engine. So maybe not a thousand times, but at least two or three hundred times. Mm -hmm. Transmissions, same thing. These things are intimidating. But once you learn how to do it, they're actually pretty easy. It takes about three or four attempts. And I'm going to give you plenty of practice. It's going to go from, man, this is confusing, to, man, this is actually pretty easy. But then it's easy to forget, too. But on your hands on final, this is station number one. You're going to be taking 16 measurements. And they all got to be highly accurate and highly precise. Basically, the numbers you give me on that paper need to be we, uh, they gotta be realistic. Mm. I, I, I got ways of knowing. And, and it usually has to do with time stamps, right? Like this person did it, they cut the rotor, and when they're done, this is what the rotor was. The next person worked on it. If their number is bigger than the last person's, I know they made it up, right? And then I, I don't know, there's a lot of different, that's one of five different things I do to verify it. Is that a working one? Is that busted? Most works. But it's way bigger than you need for a router, but yeah, I'm wondering. Anyway, the secret to this thing is, like I said, you don't turn this thing, you turn this thing. This is like a little ratcheting clutch. So when this thing hits whatever you got inside of here, it turns and turns and turns, and then look it, it lets go. It's like a torque stick. No matter how fast or much you turn this thing, it will never tighten any further than what it's already tightened. This is what makes it precise. The calibration is what makes it accurate, and that's what gets ruined when people do this. So then you end up getting consistent numbers that are wrong because people use the tool incorrectly. But as long as the micrometer is properly calibrated and you don't crank it down with this, you only use this piece right here, everybody will get damn near exactly the same value, and it will be a correct value. So micrometers, they come in inch intervals. So if you are going to uh, be evaluating something that's smaller than an inch, you're going to use the zero to one inch micrometer. If you're evaluating something that's bigger than one inch, but smaller than two inches, you do the one to two inch micrometer. Something that's bigger than two, but smaller than three, two to three, three to four, blah, 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 right? Um, most technicians are going to use these two. That's a lot of tools to measure from if, you're, if you worked in a machine shop, you'd have to have a big set of these things. Uh, a mechanic, unless you worked on engines, would rarely need one that was more than a one to two inch. You, you can get away with these two for almost everything in the <coughs> non-engine. And most, most places, you don't repair the inside of the engine. If it's bad enough, you just Toyota would just have to replace it. Just buy a remanufactured or rebuilt one. 
it's cheaper, it takes less time, and they got a warranty it instead of the dealership, as long as you install it correctly. How much is one of those cost? Twice. Uh, it depends on how good of one you want. Snap on truck. I don't know if Snap on makes micrometers. It's not my whole thing. Maybe it's not my whole picture. They might. I, I, I don't think I've ever in my life seen a Snap on micrometer. We'll, we'll look it up in a second. Oh, then they probably have blue point make it. Maybe. So here's what a standard machinist micrometer looks like. So here's that ratchet stop I was telling you about. The thimble is the part you never tighten it down. You can loosen it this way, but just don't tighten it this way. We got our, our, our datum line, you know, our graduations, you know, like this is a metric one, so this is zero, one, two, three, four, five millimeters. Here's the anvil, here's the spindle, here's the lock. So they have different lock mechanisms. The lock is, let's say, you're trying to like take a measurement somewhere you can't see it. This is the lock on this one. You can lock it in place and then pull it down and it, it, it holds its value. So if you bump it when you're taking it down, it should be in the same spot. I mean, it doesn't fully lock it down. You can still force it, but you know, if it's unlocked, you can bump it like that, see? But if I lock it, it's a lot more resistant to, to accidentally changing it. So you can pull it down and look at it, you know, put it in the light or something like that. That's what that lock does. Let's break to one fifty or two. Fifteen minutes two o'clock. Oh shit. Here's how to read a inch one. It's a lot like a ruler. Now I'm not gonna teach you with this slide how to read it because I want to take my time with it. Because again, this is you know pass or fail the class type shit right here, type things. So Toyota specifies that you take eight equal distance measurements of the rotor. Exactly what this is saying right here. Well, this is 8 to 12. But you can see how they're, they're, they're equally spaced all the way around. What I can do is get a dry erase marker, like slice like a pizza this way, this way, this way, and this way. And now I got eight spots. Um, they don't have to be exact, but what you're looking for, so this is after you did your first measurement and you determined that that rotor is worth saving. If you check in that rotor is too thin, who cares? That rotor is going to be placed. But these are the values. After you determine that the rotor is savable, these is where you find out if you need to machine it and if you need to machine it, exactly how deep you're going to cut. You don't just go in there and cut, cut, cut and cut and cut and you know, do it until you get a good surface. It's, you know, you're going to waste a lot of material that way. That rotor is everything to do with how thick it is. A, a thinner rotor is going to be less of a break than a thicker rotor. So you only need to remove, you should only remove what is required to put that rotor back in good shape. How do you know that? You, just, you take these, uh, these measurements. Um, thickness variation is one that cars are very sensitive to. And it's what it sounds like. One part of the rotor is thick and then thin, and then thick and then thin, and then thick. And what that does is it goes to a thin spot. So a little bit of brake fluid goes in there. Then it goes to a thick spot, spreads those brake pads, and sends that brake fluid back up. Causes the brake pedal to vibrate. They call it brake pedal pulsation. So you would cut it to the thinnest one, like the measurement that you took? Whatever, however deep it needs to get rid of any difference between one spot and another. So yeah, basically to the thinnest one. That will get rid of the, the differences or the variation. So if you're, um, if the thinnest measurement is like, um, Below like the specification, you would just get rid of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it ain't it ain't savable or serviceable is what they would call it. So we would only be now a lot of people they I don't know if they just heard it from somebody or they're they're intimidated by micrometers, but it's it's a myth at least with Toyotas it is and every other vehicle I, I've ever looked at. People say the whole oh, rotors come so thin from the factory, you just got to replace it every time. You're ripping a customer off. Toyota rotors from the factory have enough material that you can probably get through at least a couple of set of brake pads. Like you can machine them multiple times 
They got a huge tolerance there. They're so much thicker than the minimum thickness. So saying that they're they're too thin from the factory, I think it's just people who don't know how to read the tool. They, they don't want to look dumb, so they say, oh, this thing's they, they're so thin nowadays that you, you can't even machine them anymore. No, just look at, go look at the repair manual. You got a lot of material there. Uh, there was a, a, a counselor who used to work here, and then that's, he took it to a shop down the street. And that's what they told him. Like, all oh, those rotors are too thin. You know, they, they, they come paper thin from the factory. So he brought him in here. He's like, oh, I'm, I think they lied to me. Can you check them out? And I made it right in front of him. And we looked up TIS, and they were, they were like 80 thousandths above. Like, he could have gotten a couple, couple more sets of brake pads out of that. Yeah. And it didn't help anybody but the, but the shop, right? The shop made more money. The technician working on it, he lost that on money. He could have saved. Um, the customer money by giving him a lower bill by re re refinishing the rotors and then the technician could have made more money because um, he would have got more labor so the bill would have been cheaper and the technician would have made more money so the only person who benefited was the owner of the, of the business not, not the vehicle owner not the, not the technician so I don't know so um, for the ones who had like the cracks or like rust right you know, like when you you make one pass, you see how much rust you get off. If you did that like one pass and you you measured it, it's not even worth it no more. You just get rid of it too. Yeah, you you never want to risk a rotor getting below its minimum thickness, even if it's like halfway through the brake pad. If it's just one, do you just like replace that one? And if it's not ideal. Now disc brakes are a little bit more forgiving for that. Like I would, I wouldn't offer that, them that unless they're like, oh, I can't afford that. Like, well, I can make it a little bit cheaper. I'm not gonna be able to warranty it or whatever. Or maybe you can still warranty, but I would, I would, I would never op offer that unless it was that was gonna be the difference of them being able to afford fixing their brakes or not. You know if it's mean? like warranty, would they? Oh, well, warranty, yeah, they'd make you just replace them. Fun. Toyota, oh, Toyota, just the Toyota. Yeah, but Toyota almost never warranties any brake complaints. Unless it was like a, a, a failed brake hose that caused one rotor to go bad under warranty. But they consider tires and brakes wear items that are generally, apart from a defect, not warrantable. And if you replace like one brand new rotor, one resurface rotor, right? Would that cause like a problem because one rotor is thicker than the other one? Generally, no. Like I said, the disc brakes are a little bit more tolerant to that. Drum brakes, they got to be basically identical or that will cause a pull. Drum brakes got to be within two thousandths of an inch of diameter. So one can't be big and small because that will cause unequal braking. The disc brakes are a lot more forgiving for that. But it's just good practice to, if you do everything in pairs. So if you're gonna replace one rotor and instead of brake pads, just do the whole axle, both sides. There's always, you know, exceptions to the rule, but that's, that's, that's the best practice. That's the one that everyone wins. The customer has a better brake job, you do make more money because you know, you're, you're doing more work and the customer has, then the shop makes more money because they sold more work and the customer has a safer brake system. There's always, there's always, you know, exceptions, but drums, yeah, you'd never do that with a drum. It, it, that would cause more problems if they were different. Anyway, so that thickness variation, I guess when we get to that thick spot, it forces the brake pads apart, forces brake fluid up, makes your brake pedal vibrate, brake pedal pulsation. It could make the brakes feel very dangerous. It feels way more dangerous than it really is. It can make the whole car shake. Um, I mean, it's not great. It, it will likely increase the stopping distance a little bit, but it feels like the brakes are gonna fall off of the car. Like I've seen shake the whole car so badly that the rear view mirror that was glued to the windshield fell off. <laughs> and it was like, it like it was gonna rattle your teeth out of your head on the freeway. And that's constant? Um, usually at, at, only during braking. And usually at higher speeds is when you when you really feel it. So how would you tell if it's like the ABS or <coughs> like um, like the ABS light will usually come on to tell you that it's act that it's doing something right now. And it's a much faster <clears throat> This one just <clears throat> it's about, you know, a third of the speed. So what causes thickness variation? 
Um, the most common cause is wart rotors, mm -hmm. lateral run out. <clears throat> what does lateral run out mean? What does run out mean? That's a term you're going to see a lot. In it's like the in and out movement. That's a type of run out. It's side to side. Or Another type of run out. So you got a lateral run out. It's so it, it, it can be movement, play. Um, usually that's what, usually it's those two things. I'm probably forgetting something, but it's usually movement or play. Um, so lateral means side to side. So if this rotor is bent, and as it rotates, it's moving side to side because it's wobbling because it's bent. That's where the lateral comes from, lateral run out. Axial run out is what we just were talking about with the, the bearing play. How we push and pull on its axis. That's one. Another one which does not apply to brakes, but you'll do it in other places, like tires, is radial run out. You guys know what the radius is, the difference, distance between the center and the outside? Yeah. A perfect circle will have a consistent radius all the way around. Something that's oval or out of round will have a difference, right? The distance between this part would be more versus from this part. So that would be called radial run out because the radius changes. All we're concerned about here is side to side when it's wobbling. Lateral run out. This causes this. How long do you think it takes for lateral run out to turn into thickness variation? This is a couple of ASC questions. I don't, they don't ask directly, but they basically tell you this. Six months. It could be months, yeah. Months. Meaning that if you do a brake job, you go on a test drive, the brakes work perfectly fine. Does that mean you did a good job? No. The only way that you know that you did a good job is you got to put a dial indicator on there. You'll be surprised how many rotors brand new out of the box have way too much lateral run out. With the, with the bearing? Cause that, like, can cause that too. So we'll soak it the, soak it the hub. <coughs> this is another common cause of this. Anyway, if you ever find yourself stacking rotors, never stack them like this. This will cause a lot of lateral run out. Why is that? They're not meant to be uh, supported their weight like this. They need to be. Stack like dishes, not like books. So they should always be kept this way on the shelf. Um, when you do the um, on car very clear, right? Does it account for like the run up? Yes. That that's why we do it because is it caused by the rotor being bent or is it caused by the hub assembly being bent? The problem with the bench brake lathe is it didn't do anything for this. If this was bent, you can get that rotor perfect. But once you install it on here, well, if this thing was bent, it's going to wobble when this thing rotates. Cutting it on the car while it's installed on this um, takes that into consideration. But if the, if the bearing is bad, right? The bearing is loose and it doesn't. So if it's bad and it's loose, then the only thing you can do is replace that bearing. You're going to keep having problems. What causes lateral run out besides the hub being bent or the rotor being bent because it was you know, stored improperly on the shelf? Brakes. Um... What do you think the most common cause of this is? If you're in an accident, you hit a curb or something. That, that would have been the hub. That, that could cause this for sure, yeah. What's the, what's the most common technician cost? Technician cost? Um, like not the slight thing? Nope. Oh, lug nuts. Uneven. Yeah. Uneven and improperly torqued lug nuts. Basically using the impact gun, brr, 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 you, or doing over, a circle pattern. If you over tighten the lug nuts, right, that could bend the rotors? 
Yeah, because it's it's putting uneven stress on the on the, the hub assembly with the rotor sandwiched in between it. Aren't you supposed to like put the the impact gun like on the lowest setting? The best practice.